Um, that's fantastic. Okay, so today we're talking about three key areas. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Oliva Shei Kendi Peter, as you all know. Um, I'm the humble founder of PWEN, um, the Pan African Women Empowerment Network. So today we're we'll talking about three key areas with respect to business model. We'll be looking at design perspectives to your business model development. We'll be looking at customer value, how to create this, your customer value proposition and how to create this. And then we'll now finally go hands on into creating your business model. Um, so, uh, Okay, so firstly, um, design perspectives to business model development. Now, why I, I, I like to start with, before you think about developing your business model, the first thing you need to define and articulate well is your corporate objectives. And when I talk about corporate objectives, there are two, two key areas, your mission statement and your values. Some organizations include vision. However, from my own perspective, your vision statement is not as important as your mission statement and your value statement. So I like to focus on this. I believe every organization must have a mission statement. A mission statement simply says why you exist. Why are you in existence as a business beyond making money? And for those who own social ent enterprises, why are you in existence? Why was that organization formed? And what is the driving force behind its existence? and the values, the values just deter states in achieving our objectives, what are the characteristics or what are the behaviors that will drive you in achieving that, okay? And so, I mean, if you go online, you see, you see that most top organizations have a mission statement and their value statement. Usually you have about four or five statements. You usually have things like integrity, customer service, customer orientation, you know, different organizations have different things that define them. And the reason why I say every organization will start with this, because this underpins anything else that you do. Okay, your mission and your value statement, it's, it's the foundation. It's like the foundation of a building. It lays the perspective and it lays the framework for every other thing that you're going to do as a business and as a business owner. So when we're looking at your at design perspectives in business model development, um, we're looking at, oh, what are those things that you put into consideration when, um, when you're developing your business model? Uh, what are the um, building blocks, you know, that determine how you integrate all the different aspects together? So but before we go into that, let's start with what is a business model? So when we talk about business models, what do we mean? And according to Peter Drucker, who I believe is the founder of strategy, I, I think, I mean, anything that you want to think about strategy and business, um, he's the, is a leading thought leader, you know, in this area. And he says a business model is supposed to answer who you, who, forgive me, okay. It's supposed to answer pretty much, I mean, who you are as an organization, what value you create, what value you create and add for the customer and how you can do that at, at reasonable costs. Pretty much, what are you doing? What value are you creating for the customer? Okay. And what are you, what value are you getting? Because when you're creating value for a customer, you too in return must get your own form of value, either it's financial reward or otherwise. So what value are you creating for the customer? How are you creating that value? And what are you getting in return? That's in simple, simple terms, what a business model is and every business every organization has a business model i mean irrespective from the um hairdressing salon down the street to the vulcanizer that pumps your tire to um, the netflix the amazons every organization has a business model but the question is not all organizations have clearly articulated what their business model is and it's important for every business to be able to articulate and cascade what your business model is because it provides clarity and it provides the foundation upon which you can relate. Okay, um, let me check the chat just to be sure that I'm not missing anything. Okay, it, 
it, I mean, it creates a value and, and the foundation upon which you can innovate anything. And okay, so um, one of one key thing, I mean, your ability to communicate your business model in a succinct and a structured manner helps you. One, I think for me, the most important thing it shows your investors and your stakeholders that you understand everything that has to do with your business. And I must say this that especially for those who will be seeking for funding, most financiers and most investors do not look at your business plan any longer. Why? Because a business plan is filled with assumptions. You make assumptions that, oh, you are expecting to make X amount of sales, or you're expecting that your costs will be this. So you, a lot of the foundation of a business plan is based on assumptions. A business plan is good. I mean, Chigazi Basha will be taking us through the elements of creating a business plan tomorrow. However, what is the fundamental part of a business plan is your business model. And once you get your business model right, once you understand the elements that make up your business model, it creates, for me, it's like the crystal ball that differentiates between a business that succeeds in the marketplace and a business that does not succeed. So that said, I hope we understand what the business model is. And um, I'll just go into um, different types of business model that exist. I'm going to start with the traditional ones that we all know. I mean, that we all met, you know, in this, well, maybe not all, all met, but I mean, the old ones that we know about, we know about manufacturing. A manufacturing business model is one that converts raw materials into finished products. Um, for instance, you have a car manufacturing plant. Um, a, retailing plant uh, a retailing business model is the one that buys from the wholesalers or from the manufacturers and provides it to um, the end consumer. Apologies. Um, a distribution uh, business model focuses on taking the, um, um, the materials from where they have produced to where they'll be used either for, to the wholesaler or to the final user. Your brick and mortar, mortar stores are physical buildings that house retailing, um, in, uh, retailing businesses. For instance, you would have your shop rights that's uh, in Nigeria and I think in other African countries, then e-commerce as we all know, but those are the old business models. I like to focus a, a little bit more on the more modern or the newer business models that are evolving. And these ones that I've listed on the right, they are not all the business models that exist. They are just some of the most common ones and, and I'll touch on that. A high touch business model is a business model that um, has a lot of dependency on human touch and human um, activity in making it happen. So for instance, your barbing salon, um, what else, what else, what else, your makeup service, you know, those things are, um, high touch. The challenge with this um, high touch businesses is that they are not easily scalable because they require a lot of human and physical um, outputs. Crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing are business models that rely on other businesses or other individuals to contribute content that they sell um, or that they turn that in return they um, exchange for uh, profit. And um, Wikipedia is a key example of a crowdsourcing business model. Um, this platform, She Leads Africa, is another um, key example of a crowdsourcing uh, platform. You have Mamalet, yeah? Mamalet, I mean, all those platforms, they, re they rely on people providing content. And is that content that, that people provide that in turn exchange for revenue? You have dropshipping. So dropshipping is uh, the business model for dropshipping is a situation by a retailer provides sales to the end user, but the retailer does not warehouse any of the goods. All the retailer does is that once a, an order is gotten, the, the retailer just contacts the manufacturer and gets the manufacturer to ship directly to the end users. Now, dropshipping business model uh, requires or involves a lot of legal, it involves a lot of um, legal um, documentation just to, uh, to protect both the manufacturer and the retailer. Um, I see some hands raised. Um, I can take all questions once I'm done. Okay, so affiliate marketing. So affiliate marketing 
is a business model in which um, an individual sells on behalf of another of a, a number of um, manufacturers or producers and then gets a commission for um, for on every sale that it's made. An aggregator business, so an, your aggregator business is, um, there are platform businesses that, for instance, Amazon is an aggregator business. So what Amazon does is that it connects buyers to sellers on a platform. However, what makes it different from a platform business is that it also provides an ecosystem to support it provides an ecosystem to support the platform. Excuse me, let me, let me, I need to view the chat. Okay, um, I don't know, there's something. Okay, yeah, I've seen this. I've seen, I'm trying to just view, view something. Okay, so I hear that the audio is a bit low. I'm working, I'm gonna work on this now. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to do, yeah. Okay, so um, I've talked about aggregator businesses. Then you have um, software as a, okay, good. Thank you, Ife. So you have software as a service, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Now this relates a whole lot with IT businesses. I won't talk about that because we don't have a lot of IT people in this audience. And then you have network marketing. Network marketing, uh, it's, um, examples of network marketing are, um, you, you, you have the forever living, the long bridge model. Those are, um, those are what you call network marketing businesses. So those, those are examples, just a few examples of some newer business models. And the reason why I brought this up is so that it gives a bit of perspective to what we define as a business model when we talk about business models. The good thing about it is that most every business is innovating. So there are no hard and fast truths with respect to how your business model should be. However, um, you need to constantly evolve in your business model. You need to constantly think about how can you better serve the customers because it's from a perspective of how can I better serve the customers that a lot of these business models have evolved. So, now, so what are the key components of a business model? The first thing is who, who are you in business for? The most important thing is that you're in business for your customer or whatever, or whatever segmentation of customers that you have. And at, at, the, basics, at the basic of every thinking that you do when it comes to your business, you always need to think about this. You're in business for your customers. You're paying customers. You would have some customers that are not paying you but you are only in business for your paying customers. So every business, every innovation and every decision that you make should be geared towards how can I better serve my customer? How can I increase their gains while reducing their pains? We'll talk about that more later in value proposition. And then your business model should answer what? What exactly are you giving your customers? Um, usually it's the solution and the value that you're creating for the business and for your customers. So uh, your the what's the proposition is the solution and the value that you create. And the how, the resources. So how do you create this value? And most importantly, how do you, um, how do you deliver this value to your customer? And then you have what's in it for me. At the end of the day, you're not in, unless you're a charity like um, Paywen, you are not in, you're in business to make money. So the question is, what's in it for you? What value are you getting from this um, value that you're creating for the customer? Okay, so those are the four key elements of any business model, irrespective of whatever business model your organization runs or your business runs, 
he must answer who, who are you serving? What, what are you providing for them? How, how are you creating this value and what's in it for you? We'll talk about this when we look at the four Bs of um, business models. Okay. All right. So um, I thought to talk about this uh, briefly because um, now the six thinking I had is a tool that most businesses use for decision making. However, in my experience, I find it quite useful in um, designing or thinking about your business model. Because the reason is um, when you're designing your business model, you need to think about every possible aspect and every possible um, position that your customers could have. And what the six thinking um, has, uh, is, is about is it's just a, it's a decision-making tool in which, whereby you have six different positions. And then um, from these different positions, you look at it. So if you are wearing the red hat, you're looking at it from, how does this business make me feel? If you're looking at it from a white hat, from a white hat perspective, you're looking at the facts. What are the facts on ground? What are the key benefit? What are the key details about this business? If you're looking at it from the green hat perspective, you're looking at creativity and innovation. How can I improve it? If you look at it from the yellow hat, you're looking at it from the benefits position. And if you're looking at it from the black hat perspective, you're looking at it from the from the antagonistic perspective. You're looking at it, what will not work, okay? And I, I'm deciding to, I decided to play a short video. Uh, I think it's about two or three minutes video that will just talk briefly about what the six thinking hat is. And then I'll give examples, I'll, I'll, I'll give examples on how it can be used. method is that the human brain thinks in a number of distinct ways and can be deliberately challenged. But you look at a problem with the six thinking hats technique, solve it in a simple approach, which is to fix ambition. Okay. Hello everyone. Okay, so I hear that you can't see the video and you can't um, hear the video. Apologies for that. What I'll do is um, I'll send the links to the video much later. Okay, and um, so um, what the um, video was just saying is that the six thinking hats was developed by Edward de Bono and it helps, you know, it helps to look at your business when you're thinking about your business model and the value you create for, for the customer. It helps you to look at it from different perspective. So as an entrepreneur, the, you most likely will be very optimistic about your business idea to say, oh, this is what is going to solve. This is a um, solution I'm creating. For instance, um, I had a conversation with one of my participants and she talked about um, the fact that she wanted to go into uh, rabbits, selling rabbit meat. And I asked her, okay, fine, fantastic. Why do you, why do you think this is a good uh, business model? And she talked about, yes, the dangers of red meat and the fact that um, a lot of doctors are, are advising their patients to eat white meat. And rabbit provides a good alternative for white meat and it is nutritious and delicious and you know all that. And I said, okay, fantastic. However, putting on the black hat perspective, which is the critiquing um, part, I asked her, how are you sure that people want to eat rabbit, rabbit meat? If I had to put, put on the brain hat, I'll then be, begin to think, what creative ways can we package this rabbit meat in such a way that it will be appealing to other people? 
if I were wearing my yellow hat, I'll be looking at it that, oh, what are the benefits of rabbit meat and how can I incorporate this into my business model? So you see that when you're looking at um, your business model, it always helps to, I, I think the best is will be for you to have a focus group meeting. And we have a focus group meeting of about six people and you have each person wearing each hat. It helps to um, break down your thought processes better. But most often than not, you're not able to have a focus group. So what I usually suggest would be you as yourself, you'll be your own focus group. And then you think about your business model, looking at it from the different perspectives, from the perspective of oh, the person critiquing it, from the perspective of the person who has a creative idea, from the perspective of the person who looks at the benefits, from the perspective of the person who's looking at the plain facts, and then from the red perspective, which is the perspective of the person who's looking at it based on how do I feel about this? How does this make me feel? Does it make me feel good or does it make me feel bad? Okay, um, so um, that's about it with um, six thinking hats. And in every business model, there will always be trade-offs. There is no business model or there's no business in the world that does not have trade-offs. But I decided to talk about two, the most common trade-offs that I hear a lot of startups talk about. So the first question is, do I go for a niche market or do I go for mass market? And the honest truth is that there are no clear cut answers to this. It depends on what business you're in and um, the model you want to upgrade. However, I always would advise that as startups, you start with a niche market. The, uh, so when we talk about niche market, okay, when we talk about a niche market, a niche market is focused on a specific customer segment. So for instance, I know I was talking with someone who uh, said she wanted to make pap. She wanted to make pap. And I mean, everyone, it's an actor, are you niching your market or you want to do mass markets? Oh, she says, oh, I want to do mass markets. It's pap for everyone. However, I suggested to her, if you were going to niche, you can say, oh no, my pap is only for nursing mothers and babies. So that's a niche market and you have um, identified a subset of the larger market to focus on. So in, in designing and in producing your PAP, they're now looking at what would a nursing mother need in PAP or what would babies need in PAP? And then you're customizing your products to ensure that it meets their needs. The benefit of um, you know, niching your market as a startup is that it's less expensive for you to start off. Um, you're, I mean, every entrepreneur makes mistakes. And if you are focusing on a niche market, your mistakes are less costly, as opposed to mass markets, which requires you want a lot of money if you want, want to do like, uh, mass market. And um, a niche market also helps you provide better customer experience. So your customers get a better feeling or a better experience from how you um, deliver your products if you're niching your market and you niche it well. So I usually would advise that for startup, you look for a niche market and you focus on that niche market. And then as you grow, you can then begin to create variations for other subsets you know, of the mass market, but I mean, Nishin is just good. And in this day and age, you know, where we have um, a VUCA uh, um, economy, most organizations will tell you that there are most, most um, people, I mean, most experts will tell you that it's better to niche your market. And then there's a second trade-off that most businesses need usually have. I don't even see, especially for our startups, we usually have this value versus price. I want to deliver X value. However, my customers cannot pay for it. So this debate over the value that I give versus the price that I can, um, I can um, charge for it or the price that the market is willing to pay, it's something that you know there are no clear cut positions to it. However, as you continue to iterate your business, you continue to check this, check this, check this, check this, check this. At some point, you will come to an equilibrium of the value that you, are, you want, that you should give 
and the price that the market is is willing to pay for it. So those are just two. Those are the two most common trade-offs that uh, every business model um, would need to have, uh, um, depending on which segment of the sector, uh, which sector of the economy that you are trading in. There are other trade-offs that um, you need to consider. And then, so it leads me to um, my next point, which is on design thinking and business model development. And, you know, I started by saying you're in business for the customer. So everything that you need to do was revolve around the customer. And so when you're uh, using, um, applying design thinking to your business model development, just start with the customer. And you say, what does the customer desire? Now, there are a lot of questions, a lot of arguments to say, most times the customer does, they don't know what they want. They don't know what they need. They have all sorts of needs. For instance, you could have a guide who would say, oh, I want a tight fitting wedding dress that would show off my curves at the same time. Uh, and and that, that has, that the veil is as long as halfway the aisle. At the same time, the same um, customer is telling you, oh, I want something that is um, comfortable enough for me to show off my dancing skills. Okay, so there's what the customer desires. There's what is viable and uh, what is feasible, sorry. That's a, the second one is what is feasible. So what can you technically and operationally achieve? And then the last part is what is financially viable because I mean, the customer has what they desire. You know what is feasible in terms of design. And then the most important thing you need to look at is how viable is this? I mean, at the end of the day, what's the margin I'm going to make on this? And then the intersection of what the customer desires what is technically and operationally feasible and what is viable for you is where lies in the solution that you should provide to the market. We'll talk about this in much detail later. So that, those are just the key points on design, um, the key aspects that you should put into consideration as you design your business model. So next we're going to talk about customer value proposition and how to create it. Now, uh, that's what you call the four V's of the business model. And I've talked about it extensively, but I'll talk about it in more detail now. First, you have the value proposition. Your value proposition is the solution that you're providing to the customer as well as the value that the customer gets as a result of your proposition. Okay, as a result of your solution, pardon me. And then the value creation. How do you produce this value for the customer? What is the production process? Or what is the, um, what is the process, right? In creating this value for the, uh, for the customer. And I mean, let's use a restaurant as an example. So the value, let's assume that you have a, a restaurant. Your value proposition will be hot meals in a conducive and enjoyable um, environment. That's your value proposition. However, the solution you're providing is just food. You're providing food. That's the solution you're providing. However, the value that you're creating is hot food in a conducive and a nice environment. So you see the difference between the solution and the value, okay? Um, value creation, so how is this food made, okay? What's the production process that, uh, that goes into um, creating this value? Do you cook on site? Or do you cook off-site and you um, um, you distribute to various locations? Okay, so you need to look at how can I create this value for my customer? And then the third aspect talks about value capture. Value capture talk just talks about the fi financials. What 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 are the costs that go into creating this value for my customer? And what am I getting as return? So it looks at your cost price and your selling and your revenues, that's what uh, the value capture um, um, stand of the um, four Vs talks about. And then finally, the value network. Um, even though you are in business and you have customers, you cannot create value for your customers alone. There are stakeholders that support you. You have your suppliers, you have your partners, you have your employees. So you have a network of people and organizations that support you in creating this value. So when you're looking at your business model, you need to look at these four aspects, the four views of your business model. What is your value proposition? 
How are you going to create this value in a cost and an, in an efficient way? How are you going to dis distribute this value to um, the customer? How are you going to capture this value? What are the costs and you know, the revenues involved in creating this value? And who are the stakeholders that provide support in, um, in giving this value to the customer? Okay, so now that we've talked about value proposition, um, the value proposition canvas is another tool I like to talk about. And it's a simple tool that helps you to understand what the customers want and create products that perfectly match their needs. It's as simple as that. So the value proposition, and it's, it's a very good tool to spend some time in articulating what your value proposition is, because that is your promise to your customer, okay? It's what you're promising your customer to say, oh, this is what I will give. If you come in contact with Paywen, this is what we will give. If you come in contact with Bonnach Stitches, this is what we will give. If you come in contact with iCarella, this is what you would expect, you know, from us. And uh, I mean, it collects customer information in a simple way and helps you, you know, effectively design your business model. But let me talk about the various aspects of, um, of your um, of your value proposition. The first thing it talks about is your product market fit. And I'm not going to draw too much on this because Obo talked extensively on um, product market fit in his, um, in his last session. So I won't talk about that, but the, oh, apologies. So the next thing you need to look, talk about is the assumptions. And this is key. Because as business owners, and particularly as women, we make a lot of assumptions, both right and wrong, when it comes to our businesses. Or we assume that people will buy. People will not necessarily always buy. Or we assume that, oh, the solution that we are providing accurately fits the pain. So in, your, in designing your value proposition, it helps you to challenge your assumptions and ensure that every assumption that underpins whatever it is, whatever the solution it is that you're providing, for your customer is based on facts, verifiable facts, okay? And it, what a value proposition also does, it helps you to align your intended and delivered value. So now I know about 40% of our participants are in the fashion space, but you know, <laughs> there are usually a lot of pictures that go on, on, on social media about uh, what I want and what I get, yeah? Especially when it comes to fashion designers. So I just got this picture of, you know, uh, what the person wanted on the right hand side, uh, <laughs> what she actually got on, on, on the left. But really, as a business owner, you need to ensure that at every point in time, the value that you're delivering is the same value that you intend to deliver. And an example also comes to mind as I talk about this. There was a time um, someone introduced me to a, a, a wonderful, or someone who was very good in, in, in baking cakes. And then, oh, I decided to, you know, you know, to try her out. And she made this beautiful cake. I told her to take a picture of the cake when she was done with it. And she took the picture of the cake and then she sent it to me via Uber. You know, Uber was the one, trans uh, was a, I mean, she used one of the Uber cabs, you know, to deliver it. Lo and behold, when the cake arrived, it was a mess. Obviously the Uber driver was not, I mean, particularly careful. And then you can imagine what happens when you're, when you're not careful and you carry cake, you can, I mean, you got smudged in different areas. So as, as a business, you need to look at the value you create, the value you intend to create and the actual value that gets delivered. And you need to be very, very particular about ensuring that the value that gets delivered to the customer is what you intend. And at the end of it all, the, the, uh, the main purpose of your, of your value proposition, of designing the value proposition is to ensure that you delight your customers. Unfortunately, I, I'm not going to spend time playing the next video because I think there, uh, there'll be issues with the audio, but I will send the link to this video um, shortly after, after the session, I'll send, I'll send this. Apparently we had about four videos. And so when you're looking at the value proposal, I'll also send this template, however, when you're looking at the value proposition canvas, this is a tool. This is like the actual template that you're going to use in creating your value proposition. 
and you start with your products. First and foremost, what are the features of that product? Okay, so if you had, uh, if you are given, uh, if you are producing, okay, skincare. Let's say you are making a skincare product. Okay, uh, a face mask. Yeah, what are the features of the product? Oh, it is natural and it is organic. It is white in color. It is um, soft to the skin. It is, I mean, you, you just list what the various features of the uh, product is. If you are in, um, uh, what other examples can I use? I mean, in whatever business that you, you are given, there's some features of the solution that, okay, so you're in, you're in fashion, okay? And uh, what are the features of your, uh, of your solution? Oh, you are providing um, um, beautiful designs, you know? Um, it's, uh, Bella and Nigel like designs, yeah? Um, that have perfect fitting or that, talk, that wows, uh, I mean, audience when they see it. And what are the benefits of your product? So you need to be able to articulate what are the benefits of the product, of the features that you have? What benefit does it give to your customer? And then finally, you know, we always talk about this. What is the experience that your customer will get as a result of using this product? Because customer experience makes the difference between whether the customer will come back again and whether you're able to make money from that customer. Okay, um, so in, in designing your product, you must have your product, what you're, you're selling, what are the features of the product, what are the benefits and what the experience. And then you need to match it to the customer. What are the customer's needs? What are their wants? And what are their fears? So you need to ensure that whatever it is that the customer is fearing is minimized. You need to ensure that whatever the customer needs is met and whatever the customer wants is also met. Okay, so I'm going to share this template also, um, you know, to, to participants so, so that you can, and if you think about your business and you articulate this, the, the various elements in this, the eight different elements in this um, value proposition um, canvas, it takes away any assumption. I know they say the devil is in the detail. What these tools help you to do is to go into the cellular detail of your business. And then when you break down your business into different cells and you, you shred everything, you are able to critically look at your business, critically look at what value you are creating, how you can innovate, and most importantly, how you can make money. Okay? So um, I think this, that's this. And you know, talking about your value proposition camera, sorry, there's an error in this. What is your value proposition and how are you creating value for your customer and how do you uh, manage the expectation? How do you create gains for your customer and how do you release gains? That's what your value proposition is. How do I uh, uh, create gains and how do I, I mean, max, uh, release the, reduce the pains that my customers Having. And so let's take a, a quick look at the case study um, of, so that we can bring it on. Okay, okay, I've even talked about it earlier. So Cindy started a restaurant, she named Six to Nine Kitchen and Bar. An advertisement slogan read, No time to cook your meals, visit Six to Nine Restaurant and Bar. So what she was, uh, uh, what her value proposition is, was, oh, she was providing food, fast food. So anyone who does not have time, you know, we live in a fast um, world now and everybody wants things at the click of hand. So her proposition is if you don't have enough time to cook, and to cook, just come to my kitchen, to my restaurant and then you get good food, right? However, um, she noticed that people were not coming. I mean, um, she had talks with um, um, some potential customers and then she said, and she, discovers that customers think that coming to her restaurant does not really save time. Why? Because Simbi's waiters are so slow that it actually costs them more time to come to the restaurant to sit down to eat than to actually cook themselves, okay? And as such, there's a mismatch between the intended value that Simbi expected to create and the delivered value. So what does Simbi now do when she, when she realizes this? She doesn't sack all her Waiters, which I know would have been the first thing some of us would have thought about. But then she had to change her value proposition. 
And then she now advertises that slow food is good. Visit six to nine restaurants and bar for a comfortable and easy going and easy going night out. Okay. Now, I, I, I'm not endorsing this decision and I'm not saying, oh, this is the best decision. However, the reason why I'm using this example is just to show how your value proposition drives your revenue models. It drives how you make money. So now from communicating that, oh, uh, we want fast, quick and easy. If you want fast, quick and easy food, come to uh, Simbi. She's not selling the experience that she's creating a comfortable environment and a, an easygoing night out, you know? And th that's, the, that, that's, that's the difference, you know, between, you know, you just creating a solution and you creating an experience. And this can only happen when you, you know, go into the cellular detail of your business and now articulate, what do my customers need? So she realized that, I mean, the customers, as well as the ones who wanted fast, fast and easy food, you know, they were not getting value from her waiters. And you know, what this also brings out is that there are different segments of customers. So if we look at this case study, we we'll realize that there are different segments of customers. So there are those who want to come to the restaurant to have a good time, you know. They just want to enjoy the music, enjoy the ambience, you know, spend away the time whilst, for, for instance, it could be whilst waiting for traffic to abate, yeah, for those in Nigeria. And traffic used to be a, a big issue before the lockdown. So, I mean, so you're creating a nice, comfortable environment and, and, and a nice night out for your customers is the experience that you are creating. However, there's another segment of those who just want food quick, quick, quick. What you could do for, for those segments of customers will be to provide delivery services. So instead of just um, providing meals in plates, which would ideally find in uh, a restaurant, you can then provide, oh, uh, 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 food in five liter bowls, 10 liter bowls, two liter bowls. I mean, you provide bulk food that will be delivered to them. So you see how breaking down your value proposition and your customer segment helps you to deliver value to, the business, uh, to your customers. And it helps you to be able to charge a premium on the experience that you are creating for your customer. If you are able to meet their needs, the truth of the matter is that customers would always pay premium for people and for businesses that address their pain points. Okay, so that's it. Um, uh, moving on swiftly, so we'll not look at business model canvas. Yeah, and now that we've, we've talked about the design elements, we started by talking about the design elements in, in business model creation. We talked about value proposition, determining your value proposition. You must articulate what your value proposition to your customer is. And I mean, let me give an example um, about, since we're in fashion, about a business that I know. Okay, so there's this lady who currently makes my clothes now. Um, I'll say this, I don't think she's the most creative of all the fashion designers that have worked with me. I mean, I've, I've had some other fashion designers that are more creative than her. However, she, what I like about her is the fact that she delivers value to me how I want it. And there was a day I went to her, um, to her space and then she told me that, oh, she's redefined her business model. Now what she um, promises is that for the segment of customers that want bes bespoke tailoring, those are people who, uh, I mean, she makes custom, custom made clothes for, she's guaranteeing that you will get your clothes in 72 hours without any design error. That was the value she was proposing to that particular customer segment. And I asked her how, and she told me that she had redefined her structure to support this. So right now, at any point in time, if you put up a call to her to say, oh, I need bespoke tailoring dress, or I need, I, I need this, she's guaranteeing that you will get it in 72 hours, design error free. Okay, and she was able to walk backwards to ensure that every member of her production chain is paid based on a completed design that is error free. So if there's any design that has, or if there's, if there's any output that has any error, that, that impacts on the revenue or the income that um, 
that particular employee gets. I mean, I don't know the details, but I know she's been able to, from articulating that this is the value that I want to create for my customer, she's been able to streamline her business and her structures to ensure that these structures help in delivering this value for customer. And she told me that since she's been able to do that, their revenues has, have practically doubled because they have more customers, they, um, they have more customers demanding for clothes and they have more satisfied customers for that customer segment of hers, okay? So that's just a simple example of how you can articulate a value proposition that meets a customer pain point in a way that it's clear, simple, delivers value to your customer and delivers value to you. And what is value to you? Increased revenue and increased profits. Okay, so that's that. So let's talk about business model canvas. Yeah, and there are two business model canvases that I would recommend or suggest that we as business owners, um, we, we, we look into. And you have the Osterwaders um, business model canvas and you have the Lean business model canvas. I'll start with the Osterwaders business model canvas and it's generally called Oh, okay. I mean, this is another video. We're going to skip this. Um, and uh, well, let's test. Mm. Okay, let me still play it, you know, um, so that we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'm not uh, I, I'm not sure the audio was um, was um, was good, but let me just talk about. Uh, so this is the Osterwaders business model canvas. It's called OBMC, yeah, and it is only used for business. I, uh, well, I would advise no, I would advise that only businesses that are in their that are in their growth phase should use this. So for those who are starting off. We're going to talk about the um, business model canvas that you use next. But this is for those who already have a minimum viable product, they already have their customers, their businesses are going into the growth phase. And this is, I mean, the different parts of this is you have your partners here. Um, okay, let me play this. You have your customer segment. So I, I just like to start with the customer segments. So what are the co different customer segments that you have? I, if you are using the OBMC, I, I like for you to start when you're when you're doing this because I, I mean obviously you know this is going to be your assignment, yeah. Um, you start with your customer segments. So what are the various customer segments that you have? Um, I use the um, um, the tailoring um, um, example, and you have the bespoke segments, those who want um, tailor-made clothes for them, and then you have the those who I mean, what do you call it ready-made, yeah, the um, uh, the segments that I just want to come and pick up a clothes, I, I mean, ready to wear. Yes, that's what it's called. So you have the bespoke um, segment and you have the ready to wear, or you could have your segment as um, children, for instance, or men, you know, I mean, however you define your customer segments is up to you, you know, and um, it's up to you really. And then, you know, look at for each segment, what are the value propositions that you are giving to each segment? Okay, and then you look at the channels. So in delivering this value proposition, how do I ensure that this value proposition is delivered to my customers? Then you look at the customer rela relationships. You look at the key partners that provide this uh, and the support, that provide the support to you in delivering that value. So what are the key partnerships that you have? What are the key activities that you must undertake in providing that value that you have promised to each of the segments. And you have to do this for every segment because every segment have different value propositions and the activities that key into the value propositions for each segment are different. So I usually advise you do this for 
every customer segment. It is a lot of work. Yes, I agree, but we need to make money. And for you to be able to make money, you must understand every detail about your business. This is like a crystal ball for your business. Big organizations use this and this determines their effectiveness. That's why um, a, 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 an organization, a big organization can come today, you know, they'll start with one product and it will be a, a hit, an instant hit. And you're wondering how and why. It's because they spend a lot of time, money, resources, and people in going into this tiny and minute detail. So for you as a startup, this is the area of startups making it big in the marketplace. However, startups must be able to spend the time and the effort into looking at these granular details of their business and revolutionizing it in such a way that it adds, adds value to their customers. Okay, and then last, lastly, you now then look at your cost structures and your and your revenue streams. I always say that this is the last that you should look at because focus on value. Then you cannot look at the cost and and um, how you're going to make money out of it. Okay, so the next to not then be the lean canvas. And for startups, I know about thirty percent of us, no, about about thirty eight percent of the participants are startups. So and um, this is a model that I would advise, and it's called the lean canvas. And the reason for this is because as startups, you are still in an exploratory mode. You are trying and testing and trying and testing. Will this work? Will this not work? Will this work? Will this not work? I know we're running out of time, but I'm going to round up quickly. And this will be um, my, my last slide. Yeah, let me go into this because and this will be my last slide. So you first start with, as usual, you start with your customer segment. Who are your target customers? Next, you go into the problem. What problem are you solving for these customers? Then next, you go into the revenue streams. As you're solving these problems for the customers, what are the sources of your revenue? Um, uh, what are the sources of your revenue? Yes. Then next, you look at what solution are you providing? What are the top three features of the solution that you're providing? Then next, you go into your unique value proposition. Remember, we talked about that in previous slides. Then after that, you look at channels. How do, will your product get to your customer? And then after looking at the channels, you look at the metrics. How would you measure how successful you are as a business in delivering value to your customer? Okay, so you, you, you list the key metrics. And after that, you now then look at your cost structures. What are the costs that will go into delivering this value? And then finally, you look at what is the unfair advantage that you, know, you have? For every business, you must have what you call unfair advantage. What are those characteristics or those things that you have that cannot easily be copied or that is unique to you? So this is the Lean Canvas, and this is um, um, uh, the model that every startup should use. While the OBMC is the model that every, um, if, you're a business, if you're a growth business, in, in a, a business in the growth stage, you use the OBMC. I'd like to stop here now and take questions. But please ask your questions in the Q&A um, box. That way it's, it's easy for me to answer them. Okay, so Ebon Luwa is asking, how do you sw switch from mass market to niche? Okay, um, first question you need to ask yourself, do you need to make a switch? Okay. Even though I said, yes, it's better for you to switch, you need to look at your business model, okay? But let's assume that you have um, deciphered that, oh, you need to now switch to niche. The first, um, for me, what I, I like it to use, so when you look at the mass market, so the mass market is the general market. You look at what are the different segments in this mass market and which of these different segments in this mass market is the most profitable? At the end of the day, you're in business to make money. So yes, it's not the uh, segments that you like the most. It's not the segments that you that is easy, that is easiest for you. It's the segments that make the that has the highest return on investments that you should pick from your mass market, and then you focus on this um, segment. When you focus on this segment, you understand who they are, what they like, where they hang out, who their friends are, what are their pains. What are the things that they value most in the solution? And then you now design your solution to meet the segment. I hope I've answered that question. Um, Oluwa Tosi Awoni is asking, I don't understand what you mean by trade-offs yet. Can you explain more? Okay, so I'm, I'm saying that in every business, 
there are some things that you need to give, there are give and takes that you would have in your business. So for instance, um, if you're a skincare production um, person, and okay, so let's assume that you're, you're in organic skincare. Now there are some products in organic skincare that have a good value. For instance, let me give an example. Though. I used to make an organic skincare at, oh, well, I still make for my children, but I don't make commercially. Um, so, uh, so you have vitamin E. Vitamin E is very expensive, but it's very good for the skin. However, if you put so much of vitamin E, or if, you, if for instance, you want to add frankincense essential oil into your production, it's very expensive. So the question is, what quantity of vitamin, vitamin E should you put into your product? Or should you even put it at all? Looking at your cost structure. So that is the trade-offs that you have to uh, make between value and price. So the value that you're giving to the customer. For those who make clothes, I'm told that um, um, there's some lining that, uh, that is put under the clothes and some are cheap, some are expensive. Um, I heard the expensive ones make the clothes look nicer or and the cheap ones, you know, tear. I mean, something around, along that. But then every um, fashion designer needs to, uh, you know, articulate, okay, do I want to use the cheap one or do I want to use the expensive one? Okay, I'm not a fashion designer, but I mean, um, I'm just trying to use those examples because I know we have a lot of them in a participant's list. So I hope I've um, explained that. And then another trade, another common trade-off is whether you want to go into mass market or you want to niche your product. Um, okay, um, someone is saying, can I go through the OBMC cam canvas again? I will send a video to you, okay? Um, anonymous uh, attendee, why are, you, why are you anonymous? Please, we want to see your name. I want to know who, who, and who is asking questions. You, you won't get any points for this question that you have asked now. Okay, so when I share the video, it will provide more detail about the OBMC canvas. But in, 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 in summary, the OBMC canvas is used for um, businesses that are in their growth phase. So that means you have a minimum va va uh, uh, value product, you have your customers, you have everything set, you just need to scale your business. Then this tool helps you to di dissect your business to see how you can scale, where you can scale and where you can make, make the most money from, you know, where the innovations can, can come into place. Do I think switching to digital or technological advantage is in fashion is advisable? Oh yeah, sure, definitely. Tech, uh, I mean, you need to be able to leverage tech in everything we do now, we're in a tech area. So I think it's advisable, but however, you need to look at your customers. Um, at, will they be willing to pay when you leverage on this? Okay, what market will I advise a caterer to focus on? You need to do your mark, your analysis. You know, so I can tell you, okay, so this is from year one day or you go. If I tell you anything is guesswork, or maybe at best, I'm looking at it from my own perspective, but I may not be a large base and my profile may not be um, the profile that um, has the market for you. So you need to articulate, look at your customers and ask your customers questions. As you ask your customers questions, they'll provide you with solutions. And as they're providing you with solutions, you will not know which area you need to focus on. How can we create a business model if our business does different things? I mean, that's why I said about niching, you need to niche, okay? Um, but even if you don't want to niche and you want to have different products, you then need to have different business model, uh, different business models for every, aspect of the business. Okay, so you're into catering. So you have to do a, a business model for your catering. You have to do a different business model for your events management. And it's only you, you're doing big designing. You know, you know what they say about um, Jack of all trades, master of none. If you want to build a business that would outlive you, you need to decide which of these businesses you want to focus on. Yes, I know in terms of cash flow, you may need to do, I mean, these three businesses because you're good at them. But I always, uh, um, I mean, advise, if you focus, laser focus on one business is what will make and, uh, I mean, create the long-term success that you want, okay? How do I classify a person that started a business long time ago, then failed and decided to start all over again? You are still a startup, Emanuela. Uh, Emmanuel, you're still a startup. 
even though you've been in business for a long while and yes, you feel you're still a startup, as long as, um, uh, uh, as long as you've not articulated what uh, you've not achieved, because the reason why your business failed is because you do not achieve a product market fit, okay? So um, as long as you're just starting that process, you're, you're a startup. And so in the, on, on, I'm sorry, I can't see this clearly, but in the is asking, what if I cannot answer some of the questions in your business model? You need to answer it. If you cannot answer it, then that means you do not understand your business. You need to be able to answer. And who is the best person that you can go to help for? Your customers, your employees, the people that create value, your suppliers, ask them questions. Most importantly, focus it around your, 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 your customers. You can have a focus group session where you have rep and people representing your customers, uh, you have some people representing your suppliers and you have um, some of your employees from a focus group session of all your stakeholders and then provide answers to that. But every business must be able to articulate all the different aspects. Okay, so a quick review of the four um, base of a business model. You must have your value proposition. You must have how you create value. You must have, have how you capture value. And then lastly is the value network, the people that uh, uh, work together in providing the value to the customer. Kemi Oju Larry says, can you explain the six thinking hats again? I, I will send the video. When I send that video, it will explain it. But you know, there are six different um, hats when you talk about six thinking hats. So you have the white hat that looks at the fact, you have the yellow hat that looks at the benefits, you have the red hat that looks at the feelings, you have the black hat that, um, that it's uh, that is usually um, looking at why it will not work. And then you have the green hat that looks at um, the creative aspects of you know, the business. And then you have the blue hat that links all this and the process uh, hat that links everything together. Can we get the Zoom recording? Yes, like you did last week, you're gonna get the Zoom recording. On our business model, would you cat categorize travels and tourism? It depends on what part of travels and tourism that, you, and that, you're, that you're doing, okay? There are different segments uh, of businesses and travels and tourism. Okay. Um, Sandra. Okay, Sandra is asking, please, in the area of internet, how do I get my, how do I get my customers how do I get my customers to get hard copy textbooks instead of ebooks? They most they mostly go to and cheaper for them. I'm not sure I understand this question. So um, if you have hard copy textbooks, um, in this day and age, nobody reads hard copy any longer. Most people prefer um, you know, soft copies. So the question is, how can you provide soft copies? Um, for to your customers, you need to look look into that. Um, you can also explore if you are because I know a lot of Nigerians um, shy away from ebooks because they say people do not respect uh, intellectual property in ebooks. So you can also um, explore Kindle, yeah, Kindle um, Kindle on Amazon. You can explore that. It's been clear so far from the illustration. How does she know people want to eat rabbit meat? So how do you Okay, so how, how would she know? Is to, I mean, you ask, you never know until you ask. So you ask a, um, I mean, a segment of people. This question is from Ife Ajeoye. And she's saying that from the illustration I mentioned, how does the person know that the people want to eat rabbit meat? And my answer to that is that you ask. So you do a focus, always ask, you know, do the field um, investigation in, um, in articulating your business idea is important and key. So ask your potential customers, oh, you're trying to target people who are not eating red meat or who do not want to eat red meat for health, health reasons. So get a sample of them. And I always say, get like 100 people. By the time you get 100 people and then you ask them questions, you'll be clear as to what exactly their needs are and how you can meet those needs. Okay, I'm just gonna answer two more questions. Um, Recorded version, yes, you'll get it. Oh, design thinking. Design thinking just says, um, it's looking at it that everything that you do must look at it from the perspective of your customer. So this question is from Lua Kemi Ayamide. She's saying that she explained the design thinking um, um, in business model development. 
design thinking looks at your looks looks at your business from the perspective of the customer, how the customer would interact with your business. And it looks at an intersection of what the customer needs, what you can produce, and what is viable. So whatever you get as an intersection of all these three areas is what you will now then focus on as a product. Okay, anonymous. Okay, I'm not going to answer any anonymous question again. You need to have your name there. What can I do? This will be the last question I'm ask. I'm answering. What can I? Okay, okay. Just two more. There are just two more questions. Okay, I just answer. It. What can I do for my lower call? What can I do to align my delivered value to my intended value? When I notice that my intended value is not what my customers are getting. So if your intended value is not what your customers are getting, you need to look at the process and try to articulate why are your customers not getting the intended value? And then you now need to address those process flaws. That's what I'll, I'll get. And you need to ensure that your intended value is what your customers want. So if your intended value is what your customers want, all you just need to do is look at then the process and say, oh, so if I want, um, my customers to get a beautiful cake, you know? So what are the, what are the um, different processes that are involved in getting you know, a delicious cake, a beautiful and a delicious cake? What are the different processes in achieving that? You need to look at the measurements, you need to at baking, you need, you need to also look at the delivery. I mean, so you look at the different segments in the production and delivery process and see what is wrong and then fix what is wrong. Is it necessary to ask question? Okay, so I have this question from Jane. Is it necessary to ask questions from people doing the same business as you? And I want to particularly address this, yeah? We are in the area of collaboration. The fact that you are doing something and then that person is doing something and the person is your competitor. You need to find ways in which you can collaborate. And let me use a typical example. If you go to the market, you especially, um, I mean, for, if you go to a spare parts market, for instance, you realize that it's almost like a cartel. Why? Because every spare parts seller is united in some form of, I mean, they collaborate. And so it makes the market a more formidable force. I see a lot of competitions going. However, I look forward to having a lot of collaborations between women. Because by the time we begin to collaborate, by the time we begin to work together, we begin to to, to, to get bigger businesses that create more value and more revenue. Do not forget, I always say, it's better that, that you have 1% of a million dollar business than for you to have 0% of a hundred naira business. So let's look at collaborations. Let's look at how we can foster collaborations amongst ourselves. Okay, Tolu Wanemi Smith is asking, what if your business is logistics career service? How do you identify the key features? You can always identify. So and uh, it's uh, you are delivering um, goods from point A to point B. Who are your customers? Your customers are the people that you are delivering um, the courier service to. What do they want? They want a uh, fast and efficient service. They want to be able to track where the goods are at any point in time. They want uh, reliability. So if you say that, ah, I'm going to deliver at X time, they want to be sure that yes, you'll deliver at those times. So looking at your customers to say, oh, what do they want? Speed over cost. Because I know with logistics, sometimes it's cheaper for you to aggregate all the courier requests into one location and then shift, for, shift you know, to a different location. And you, that usually will take maybe two or three days. But sometimes your customer is saying, look, I want it same day, no matter the cost. So look at your customers and then find out what they want. Do they, do they want speed over cost? And then you can then begin to define and design whatever solution that you're given to meet whatever your customers need. Okay, so I think I have answered all the questions. We have spent way, um, I mean, we spent more than, um, more than we should. Thank you all for ladies for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, you can always um, send your questions to info at paywind.org. I'll be um, happy to answer your questions. So to this, I'll say thank you.
Thank you, thank you. And um, do enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, have some people raising.